Hi everyone, I'm Bola Musa, partner and chief scientific officer at Chardon. Our, our motto is where disruption banks. Thanks for taking the time to join us virtually for Chardon's Prescription Digital Therapeutics Summit. As you know, Chardon is an independent global investment bank focused on companies with the potential for, for, the potential for exceptional long-term investment returns uh, from creating real value for society and sharing in that value. Uh, we have obviously taken a view that prescription digital therapeutics and digital health more broadly have the potential to transform clinical outcomes, and not only that, but also mitigate costs in the uh, healthcare system. With that, um, I'd like to welcome everyone to join this session, which addresses some of those topics. It's titled, The Emergence and Disruptive Nature of Prescription Digital Therapeutics from the Clinician's Perspective. Joining me, joining me on the panel are Dr. Elisa Marco who's a cognitive and behavioral pediatric neurologist. We also have Dr. Arwin Podesta, who's, a, who's an adult psychiatrist. And we have Dr. Mark Banaka, who's a cardiologist and vascular medicine specialist. So thank you for joining. As a reminder to attendees, if you'd like to ask a question of our speakers, please type it into the question box under the video. For this session, it'll end in about an hour um, and we'll cover three big uh, areas. First is the adoption and obstacles around prescription digital therapeutics. Second is how prescription digital therapeutics work in the typical patient visit. visit. And then lastly, we want to discuss new opportunities ahead based on uh, focusing on trials, the right disease states in patients, and maybe the enhancement of resources for physicians. So thanks again uh, to the panelists, and we'll start with adoption uh, questions around that. So um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll start with Dr. Podesta. Could you discuss what you see as the most important attribute of digital therapeutics uh, in terms of their adoption? Um, you know, whether you want to focus on value outcomes, coding for physician use, ease of use, what, what do you think is, is the reason to adopt these, these new technologies? Yeah, thank you. And by the way, thank you for hosting this. I think this is really important. And I love being involved in things that include the word disruption, because in my field in psychiatry, we have a very um, almost archaic way of practicing. Um, and we don't reach the patients when they need the care necessarily. And so that's one of the beautiful things about utilizing a take-home technology um, rather than um, only having a therapist that might see a patient once a week or once a month or only have me. I'm a specialist in addiction medicine, in psychiatry, holistic integrative medicine. I have multiple practices and I don't get to spend a long time with my patients just because of the very nature of the need. Um, and so I want to have really something that goes home with the patient, you know, patients, let's say I'm using some tools for addiction. I work with people with heroin and opioid addiction very frequently. And um, one of the tools is medication assisted treatment. Thank goodness it saves lives, it's preventive and it really does help transform people's brain chemistry. So they get out of the cravings but they don't necessarily have the tools um, and they learn those tools in group and individual treatment settings. But when do those group and individual treatments happen? During the daytime, when there's other distractions around too, which is great. However, the most um, fundamental piece of the uh, digital therapeutics that I cherish, that I think is, is superior to, um, to using therapy alone, is having it available in someone's pocket or while they're going through their most stressful time middle of the night. You know, we don't have a therapist or a sleep specialist or an addiction specialist that's going to answer the phone in the middle of the night in crisis. And even most 12-step most, uh, sponsors are not going to answer the phone. So this isn't necessarily a crisis management tool, but it is something to allow people to use um, cognitive behavioral therapy modules to help them during their um, most heightened type of need. And so that's true for the apps that I use for the digital therapeutics I use for um, addiction and for opioid addiction specific and also for sleep, sleep, uh, sleep cognitive behavioral therapy. So that middle of the night is very 
uh, very powerful. And that's one of the things that patients respond most frequently that they like and that they respond, that they have good outcomes with. Great, and because this is such an important question, we'd love to hear from Dr. Banaka and, uh, uh, and then Dr. Marco in terms of adoption. Yeah, th thanks so much for the opportunity. I'll echo how wonderful it is to have this uh, this discussion here and how exciting it is to have this whole new toolkit of uh, digital therapeutics. In terms of adoption, I'm a, a cardiologist and a vascular medicine physician. I focus a lot on prevention and trying to mitigate risk factors for disease. And I think for adoption, there's sort of two, two components of that. First, what is the mechanism of benefit and, and is it novel? And as was just discussed, cognitive behavioral therapy actually has very strong database for efficacy, but it is difficult to access. And I have to say in reality, in my patient population, and I have a lot of rural patients, I'm out here in Colorado, it, it's really just not, not available. On, in, in a scalable way for, for patients. And so to have um, the digital option of personalizing and accessing CBT um, in a way that helps people actually address root cause rather than just band-aids for risk factors is actually incredibly exciting. Now, for adoption from a clinical perspective, um, we, we, you know, we always like to see data. And I do think that we need robust studies to actually show you know, what, what digital therapeutics are doing and how they operate as an adjunct to uh, traditional medical care. And so I think part of adoption from the clinical perspective is having data that supports use of those. From a patient perspective, you know, I work a lot with patients around risk factor modification. And one thing I hear all the time is that people don't really want a Band-Aid. They don't want to take more pills. They don't want to hear that they're sick. They want to be empowered to actually improve themselves and to become well. And I, and I think adoption for digital therapeutics does depend on them feeling that they're being in do that. I think actually CBT is an excellent way. And it's a very private way. You don't have to come talk to the nutritionist and say, well, you know, we're able to do this or that. And instead, um, you know, you're able to... Uh, uh, empower them in the privacy of their own home to, to work on their own risk factors. And then ultimately, again, I mentioned, um, you know, we have a very uh, diverse population here and uh, having access is so critical. And that I think is so exciting about digital therapeutics that, you know, some places here in Colorado, people have to dr drive 90 miles to get to primary care physician. You know, there's just no way for them to access an intensive sort of uh, cognitive behavioral intervention for, for diet or risk factors and, and you know, therapeutics open that up for them. And Dr. Marco, I, I know they've covered quite a lot, but anything else you'd add to the adoption? They have, and I, I was thinking as I was listening, there's things that I'm learning as I'm going along. That's one of the reasons I love being part of, um, of these panels. So thank you, um, Dr. Podesta and Dr. Banaco. I think that there's five pieces to adoption and you know there's the patient component and then there's the provider component the first piece that has to come before adoption is there has to be research that's showing the efficacy of a tool and that research can be at lots of different levels from um, you know single lab studies to more multi-site studies showing at benefit and efficacy to, or to just more empirical, it's been done for a long time, and it seems to be um, it seems to be beneficial in a um, in a particular practice. But the first for adoption is really some level of research to show the efficacy of a tool. The second is ideally some form of more sort of general um, stamp of approval. Like it, you know, one of the things that we tend to think about as the ultimate stamp of approval would be an FDA stamp of approval, but I see that as being ideally the sort of second. So first you've got your um, research confirming the benefit. Second, you have some level of stamp of approval. The third comes with the ease of the getting the prescription or getting the treatment. And so whether that's digital fulfillment from a pharmacy like Phil or being able to get it through the app store, it has to be ease. Of, um, of getting the tool to your phone or your iPad or your um, screen-based tool of whatever, you know, wh whatever nature or getting your little device from your, you know, from your um, physician or from the manufacturer. The third is that there has to be enough information provided either to the patient or to the provider about what this tool is going to 
do, right? So you have a certain level of providers who have maybe been part of the development of a tool. And so they obviously know it and they're using it, but you got to obviously get beyond those sort of first level providers to the more um, general providers. And also I think a lot of in this digital space, a lot of this information de um, delivery is kind of marketing direct to the patient. Um, so providing the information is the sort of fourth piece of adoption. And then the fifth piece of adoption is that it has to come around full circle and that it has to be helpful so that it kind of comes back around to feed, to feed the process. And so I see those as being sort of the five steps that are necessary to get to a full adoption of a new tool, um, whether it's, you know, in the prescription digital therapeutics or m really in any of our therapeutics. Got it. And, and then a question to Dr. Podesta, um, and just a little bit of background. I'm asking this question because years ago when I would speak to generalists about the future of digital health, they understood that, you know, compliance of some medications is 33% after a year. So even if you could boost it to 50%, you can affect outcomes. Uh, so they got that part. But I think they always had questions around the case of addiction. Uh, and their question is, are you basically substituting one digital addiction for uh, a non-digital addiction, right. a more benign one uh, for, for in, in that it's a phone, for example? How, how do you see this question? Well, I think that's a great question. I hear all over the place, I hear, isn't it just substituting one thing for another? And that's true with medication assisted treatment. People have that perception as well when you're taking someone off of heroin or opioid pain pills or alcohol and putting them on buprenorphine or naltrexone. And you know, people always ask that. And in fact, it's not just, let me say this about medicine and then make the analogy to the digital therapeutic because you're going up on a drug and then falling down on a drug and then you're having brain damage and cravings and making the addiction stronger when you're coming off the drug. Whereas when you have a medication assisted treatment, it's a really smooth and steady process and it doesn't have that roller coaster any longer in the brain. And that's why even things like methadone are so effective for um, abstinence and actually uh, mental transformation, truly healing. So when you add a digital therapeutic, um, even though it is on the phone, you know, it makes it so that someone is actually learning these processes. We have very um, great knowledge on the evidence of cognitive behavioral therapy and the reset and reset O that are the ones that are developed for addiction. They're very um, specific and um, algorithmic laid out modules that are going, that do help different parts of the brain advance and change cognitions and therefore change behaviors. And yes, those behaviors are still dependent on a device, right? Which is something that maybe we have a little bit of hang up about, but the fact is um, people are on their devices an average of four to six hours a day. Mm -hmm. And if we can use, you know, 20 minutes of that to be a healing tool and um, really make some uh, future changes, then we can, you know, save lives and change generations. Got it. Thank you for that. And a uh, question for Dr. Banaka. Um, you know, obviously cardiology is different from neurology, psychiatry. And what do you think people miss most about the opportunity for prescription digital therapeutics to have an impact in your field? It's a great question. Um, you know, there are in, in sort of prevention and cardiovascular and cardiometabolic disease, there are sort of two, two kinds of things that we think about. One are sort of surrogates of disease or risk factors, risk, things that are associated with risk. So for example, sedentary lifestyle or diet, um, hemoglobin A1C is a biochemical marker that we measure to understand how well some blood sugar is controlled all of those things. And then there are really the, what we describe as hard outcomes in, in clinical trials, which are really things that happen to people. So, you know, what happens to somebody um, who, who, who is getting intervention A versus B in terms of their risk of having complications of diabetes, of uh, going to the hospital and having a heart attack or stroke or all the downstream things of, of that elevated biomarker. And so I think, you know, what we're missing a little bit, and I think what, what needs to be developed is robust data to really show that one, people will use it, that it will modify the surrogate markers, that people can lower their 
hemoglobin A1C, maybe they can exercise more. You mentioned adherence. That's a huge gap that we have right now in all the clinical trials show that for most medical drugs, for example, there, there's a lot of attrition over time. Those are important, but then ultimately real world studies where we understand the downstream impacts of that. How does that translate into retained kidney function, fewer eye problems, fewer visits to the hospital for things like congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, stroke. And I think those data will be incredibly important for us to understand the, the broader impact. And I actually think the digital therapeutics are quite exciting because when we, when we think about pharmacotherapies, they're, they're usually extremely targeted to one receptor to have one effect. So you want a blood pressure drug that just lowers blood pressure, and then that has a predictable effect on outcomes. When we think about some of these digital therapeutics, there are actually multiple mechanisms of benefit. It could be that somebody you know, through cognitive behavioral therapy improves their diet and lowers their blood sugar, but they also may adhere better to drugs. They may go to their doctor's appointments. They may get their preventive exams for their eyes and for their feet so that they don't have ulcers and amputations. And so the magnitude of benefit actually may exceed any one biomarker. And so I think getting the, the totality of the data in, in real world studies would be really important. Got it. And on the question of generalizability, what do you have any thoughts there? Well, you know, it, it's uh, so so you know, we I, I work in clinical trials and generalizability is always an issue of how does this population match who 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 you, who you care for? You know, as I mentioned, the, the patients I see here, I, I lived in Boston for a long time and, and, and it's just different out in Colorado where we have rural populations and we have different demographics. And so you always want to ask that. But I will say that um, as I engage with some of these therapies and, and even engage in some of the, the research studies, it, it's remarkable that some of our preconceived notions about you know, how this may or may not be generalizable is uh, you know, sort of proven false. So for, for example, you might say in a trial that you, know, you wanna enrich for younger patients who are more tech savvy and able to use digital therapeutics. But I've been um, really uh, impressed with the group of elderly patients that I interact with and how open and receptive they are to this and how uh, they enjoy it actually. And so, you know, I think generalizability is an issue and the broader these real world studies are that can, can really understand, you know, how people interact with it and how to optimize interaction is really, really important. So, so I think they are probably more generalizable than we would, we would expect based on preconceived notions. So you've mentioned cognitive behavior therapy a couple of times. Um, th does it sound uh, th does that mean that you'll be working in the future with someone like Dr. Podesta to help improve patient outcomes? Well, I, I hope so. You know, medicine, it, you know, it's sort of artifactual, right? We have these specialties designed around organ systems or, or types of disease, but, but actually we're treating whole patients. And, you know, holistic medicine has to consider the individual and all, all of the things that um, happen to them. And, and so, you know, I can't, as a cardiometabolic specialist, just think about what drug can I use to lower hemoglobin A1C without understanding root cause and understanding, you know, what are the drivers between, you know, behind the diet and, and glucose, all those sort of things. It, otherwise, it's a Band-Aid. And we know that those Band-Aids really don't work effectively over time. You know, the natural history of diabetes, for example, is a progressive disease. And most drugs you know, lose their effect over time as people become more insulin resistant, and then they progress to needing insulin having complications. So yes, I think ultimately, you know, a team-based approach holistically considering the patient and the root cause of disease will be optimal for, for care. And I want to jump in there because I do hope that Dr. Banaka and I can work together. And that's what I love about being in the holistic field and the, and the future of our medicine and using things like augmenters and, um, and tools like digital therapeutics. Um, I do think that we have been siloed and that, you know, when you treat the heart and I treat the brain, sometimes we're fighting because I need more cholesterol and you need less cholesterol. So we need to come to terms of what is the, what's the root cause and how we're going to help each individual as opposed to only looking at the large databases. And that's why I like the um, addition of therapies like this that are really doing like you said, multifaceted treatments, um, treating the whole person. So I, I love that question and I look forward to the future. Got it. So, I mean, obviously digital and prescription digital therapeutics are often outcomes driven, uh, the data. They have data that pr prove like regular drugs that they work pretty well and they have the potential to preserve costs in the system. 
So I want to focus on what the obstacles are to broader adoption, given the powerful and disruptive nature of this new tech. So Dr. Marco, could you start our next segment on obstacles by uh, talking about what's holding PDTs back from uh, standard of, uh, from replacing or augmenting standard of care uh, based on what you've experienced in your practice. Absolutely. And I had one comment on the previous, um, the previous question about replacing one addiction for another, um, which um, I, I would say is what in some ways that thought is what drove me into this field which is that I realized with kids with digital play that you can't beat it and realized that for the work that I do, which is working on building cognition and, um, and sort of trying to augment good cognition, that if you can't beat it, then the better, the better approach is to join it and to be able to replace that play that is happening anyway you know, Dr. Podesta, that, that number of four to six hours a day is staggering. And so what I call that is positive play and being able to replace that time that's spent with the device with something that's actually going to build better, stronger, more efficient, and um, hopefully more harmonious pathways in the brain. So I just wanted to kind of throw that in on the, on the, on the last discussion. And so in, in terms of obstacles, I think the biggest obstacle that we see in terms of adoption is sometimes it's on the provider side. There are some aspects in the um, pediatric neurodevelopment world that kind of comes back to that concept of, do we really want our kids on the screen for more time? And what I would say in terms of that obstacle is that I think it is really important for kids to limit the amount of time that they're on their screen. And in you know, my practice at Cortica, where, um, where I work now, we've got about 12 sites around the country. Um, so it's sort of something that we're, we're hoping to propose more and more along with uh, you know, pediatricians, child neurologists, and developmental pedi uh, pediatricians, that there's, there does need to be a limit to the amount of screen time. And if you can use that screen time to positive play, then I think that will help to assuage some of the parental as well as the provider concerns about that total amount of screen time. So I would say concern about total amount of screen time is certainly a big obstacle. The second big obstacle, again, is just getting the information out to individuals about the actual research that's been done. So to, to that point of generalization, I think in looking to assessing a digital therapeutic, what I, what I think is a good practice to assess is this a digital therapeutic that I, that I wanna get behind is um, when you're looking at the data, is this a digital therapeutic that has outcomes that are both um, engagement based that are looking at that at what I think of as like a, a near outcome so are they getting better in the thing that you're hoping to train them for so for us it might be sustained attention or the ability to shift set flexibly with one of the digital therapeutics that I've worked with quite a bit um, called Endeavor and then you want to look for that um, more far generalization. So how is that affecting their abilities for attention, for example, in the world, the real world based on parent report? And then ideally, um, it, you know, at least in a portion of the research that's available, looking at a, a physiologic measure. So we look at EEGs, looking at brain activity to see if we're shifting the marker that we think is a good marker for that particular cognitive function. And so I would say in terms of um, being able to convince folks that this is something that is going to be helpful and also generalize, looking for those pieces in the research that's available. And then obviously just getting it um, so that it's really easy, easy to download, easy to prescribe, and then from the provider side and then easy to access from the patient side and also obviously a price point that's going to make it feasible and then the final thing um, is insurance and so I you know we can we can come back to that that's obviously a huge thorny subject I think at this point in time it's really difficult to get digital therapeutics covered by insurances and that's obviously a huge optical that we're going to need to get past just to yeah, put the quick follow up then to you, Dr. Podesta, apologies. Um, I, I know for children, screen time's an issue. Um, 
And so the perception of it being a problem obviously is an obstacle, but is screen time bad, uh, you know, outside of let's say watching in Kanto where the camera angle switches every five seconds and attention isn't built. Um, but if let's say attention's focused on a, uh, on a digital therapeutic, is that in and of itself a bad thing for kids or we need more work? So in Kanto, such a beautiful movie though. Okay, but, but, aside, but, but aside from that. My son loves it, but go ahead. A really sweet message. But, but aside from that, it depends on the kid and probably on the adult as well, the amount of time that we can engage and then still disengage. In general, we find that under 30 minutes for most kids are able to engage and then disengage. And so most of the digital cognitive trainings are in that sweet spot, sort of 20 to 25 minutes. Um, it, one of the things that I was you know, uh, hoping to sort of throw out there also is that we are missing long-term studies. We are missing dosage related studies. So there's still a lot of information that we need to add to our fund of information. But just a reminder, this is a really young field. And, um, and we're just at the beginning of it. And then there's a lot that we know. And then there's a huge amount that we still need to learn. And so, um, so an exciting space to be in. Got it, Dr. Podesta. Yeah, um, I think that the adaptability is what I wanted to speak to. What Dr. Marco was talking about is the different layers that include from you know um, provider to uh, to patient and patients' families in your case especially. And I find that when I when I ask providers about this, I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I asked a lot of providers, and they're waiting for understanding more. Like, even though it's there, it's evidence, it's FDA approved, 75% of the people that I asked said, I don't know enough about it. And so therefore I won't prescribe it, even though it's a digital therapeutic that's FDA approved and that's covered by many insurances as far as, you know, in the addiction space, mm -hmm. it's actually covered by a decent amount of um, private insurances and by the company. And then as well, you know, we're working with people who have such a high fail rate and a failure in opioid addiction in particular is death or potential death or mor morbidity. And so I'm just surprised that providers aren't really jumping at this. I'm an early adopter of things like this because I see the patients that have such a high need. And if I can give them, you know, a 15% or a 40 or, you know, stack another thing with another 15%, give them a 30% better likelihood then they, their families, their children, you know, I always think about like saving generations, changing generations, because I work with so many pregnant moms with opioid addiction and it's just so important. And so how do we get the provider to be more comfortable adopting? And um, Dr. Panaka, Dr. Marco, yeah, Dr. Amstu, we all know this. If you're not taught it in medical school or if your mentor in residency doesn't do it, you don't do it. You don't adopt it. You don't adapt. You don't do, you know, medicine is just, we're sometimes feel like we're in a grind, except for those of us that are fortunate to be in an academic space or in a couple others. So how do we get this information into medical schools? How do we get this information into um, something that we learn how to deal with? Because this is a new era. This is a new paradigm. And we need to, you know, start from the, the prescriber, from any prescriber that's going to be working in these spaces. And, you know, there's, there's loads. You're working with the ADHD one, Dr. Marco. I work with the ones for substance use disorder and also for sleep. There's other ones that are already available for irritable bowel syndrome, for post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, and those are already FDA approved and they're just very, very slow to adopt. And I think part of that is, is that we haven't been reaching the new prescribers. We haven't been educating in the, in the medical schools and residencies um, because I know people are just kind of stuck in the grind and it's hard to adopt a new thing because we do so many things as it is. Got it. Uh, Dr. Banaka, your colleagues covered quite a lot already, but anything you'd add from your practice or any other quick fixes you might mention? Uh, Dr. Podesta mentioned uh, maybe educate uh, the up and coming doctors. Um, and any thoughts on either topic, please? 
Yeah, it's a great question, and I, I thought great, great comments. I won't, I won't repeat them, but, but I do think that for there to be adoption, the, the key obstacle is that you need a common, common sort of consensus amongst the care team and the patient that this is, this is going to be worth the effort, right? And there's a lot out there in the digital space that doesn't really have any data. I have patients asking me, "What about this? What about that?" And you know, I tell them, "Well, I, I, I don't know," right? And so then data is critical. We need to know the efficacy and safety of these interventions. We need robust studies that meet the, the, the same threshold for rigor that we depend on for drugs or for other, other devices. But that's usually not enough to, to move the needle, right, in the clinical space. Part of it then is to show the, um, not just the efficacy, but the effectiveness. What, what is the clinical impact and to show repeatability in, in different studies, you know, and so I think that you can't just have one study, but you need multiple studies. You need to understand duration and mechanism, and then it's education. And, and I think the, the comments that were made is spot on. Not everyone's gonna adopt this at the same rate. And it, even within a multi-specialty practice, you may have a, you know, a, a, a specialist who's, who's really eager to adopt, but then the primary care doctor says, ah, don't waste your time with that. Then, then all of a sudden you have a challenge or an obstacle. So you need, you need a unified approach to adopting these digital therapeutics. So I think data, education, um, ultimately, of course, cost, and you have to convince payers, and then integrated care. But I think there has to be a common voice so that we support people in adopting these. Got it. So for, for non-digital therapeutics, um, I'm used to reimbursement being kind of the key gating factor, especially in the US. Um, so Dr. Marco, could you discuss a little bit more about what it's like to get your patients reimbursed uh, from the insurance companies? or and anyone, please feel free to, to afterwards discuss, you know, do you need counseling on staff? Do you, do you need to have billing reimbursement teammates on staff? You know, what, what are the resource gaps um, that could be filled as quick fixes? So let's start with Dr. Marco. Yeah, and I'm excited to hear about the, what the other folks are seeing as well, because I would say in our space um, with the pediatric cognitive and behavioral approaches, we are not seeing them yet approved by the insurance companies. And so families are paying for them out of pocket. And um, I would say that this is something that I think that the folks that are bringing the products to market are aware of. And I think they are trying to make it affordable for families. But um, you know, one of the reasons why I try and get involved with as many studies as I can is because when I can get access for free, during the course of a research study for a digital therapeutic, that means I can get access for everybody who I think may benefit from it. And so I would say in our space still, I know that the folks that are bringing these digital therapeutics to market are, have their eye on the insurance reimbursement. And at this point in time, I have not seen, um, even in, in our practice at Cortica, which is pretty, um, we're all insurance based for basically everything except for the digital therapeutics at this point in time. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Dr. Podesta and Dr. Banaka are seeing in their space so that we can get better. That's helpful. Uh, Dr. Podesta? Yeah, so um, the main three that I use are um, all by the same company. Um, Somrist is a sleep cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia and Reset O is an opioid um, cognitive behavioral therapy, specifically for people who are taking opioid management medications such as buprenorphine um, or I believe um, some others. And then um, Reset, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy for all addiction, um, not alcohol specific though. And so all three of those are somewhere in between covered by private insurances and sponsored by the company. So for those with private insurance, I have had no problem for over almost two years getting those three covered. Um, I haven't dived, I, I sadly haven't dived into the PTSD and ADHD apps yet. I'm very excited about those PDTs um, and also the irritable bowel syndromes. And those are by different companies. So their payer base, I'm not sure. I do know that there are some discussions with Medicaid and Medicare in those with those three that I'm talking about. And then hopefully that would filter out into, um, into the other uh, prescription digital therapeutics. So, um, and I do believe that there's a bill somewhere about Medicare covering these. And I don't know the details of it, but um, if someone has that question, I'm sure we can find that information. 
Got it. And for our listeners who are new to the space, those products mentioned are from Pure Therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Banaka. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a challenge with all therapies um, getting coverage, and I think even even more so here, just because it's so new. Um, you know, our our approach is to use. Um, well, we've studied different approaches using implementation science studies to try to understand how to, you know, how to get things covered, how to get them to patients. Uh, ultimately, we find that a team approach using, you know, the staff in the clinic, um, pharmacists, others to help support the need for this and make the case to payers. We know the companies that that make these things are are working to try to get them covered, but we also feel like it's our responsibility as the medical team to help our patients get them. And if we believe that they're efficacious, um, then we need to advocate on their behalf. And I've had many phone calls with uh, you know different different companies, insurance companies, to say I I need the patient to get this, both for medical par- therapies and digital therapeutics. So I think we have to work together as a medical community to build the case here um, that this isn't just sort of a one of or something, but we have a whole new toolkit here to offer to our patients as an adjunct that's going to help them be better. And we need that to be accessible and an issue for access is cost. I do want to mention that, you know, uh, Dr. Bonanga, you've talked about data. Dr. Marco, we have data. And what's so great about these these tools is unlike a therapist seeing someone in an office once a week who might not be doing, you know, a scale pre, middle and post, and then also collecting all this other user data and, you know, isn't reporting to the insurance company if they no showed for only, you know, part of the appointment or all of the appointment. So, you know, we are actually, the PDTs collect data. And so we can see the durability and we know that some of them have like really uh, long-term durability in the studies that have been done beyond a year, but some of them, um, we don't have that data yet, but the data is being collected. And so that's also some of what's like in psychiatry, we don't have anything like that because we never remember to do all of our quality of life and HAMD and HAMA scales. We, we don't do it uh, an, on a regular basis. And so, um, you know, in cardiology, you can have a lab value that you follow that the insurance can see or that the payer can see if it's a useful tool. But we also don't know if the lab value is reflecting patient's lifestyle or taking a medicine or if the patient's even taking a medicine and following through because adherence is low. So these PDTs actually track adherence, they track data and they track um, certain outcomes. And so I think it's a better uh, tool in some ways, um, but of course I wanna make sure that we are calling it an augmenting tool because it's not a replacement. Got it. And in the spirit of understanding what you just said better, uh, Dr. Podesta, I, I'm interested in what it actually, I wanna make it tangible for listeners. What, what is it actually like to treat a patient now versus five years ago? So how, how much time do you spend with your patients uh, and when you're thinking about uh, digital therapeutics, you know, what's the pathway to prescribe? Is there a patient dashboard? You know, how does it work? So we'll go from you to Dr. Marco and then Dr. Banaka. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, the, the most tragic thing I treat because of the high risk of overdose and death is opioid addiction. And so I'll give an example of an opioid addiction patient that comes to me for like an intensive outpatient programming um, where they might do, um, uh, we do an ambulatory detox with medicine, get them off of the opioid, move them over to um, to three days a week of therapy, group and individual plus um, uh, plus medication management. The nurse sees them weekly. The doctor sees them every two weeks um, during a 12 week period as they're transforming kind of their thinking and transforming into a drug-free lifestyle. Um, during that time, the ideal is onboarding one of the digital therapeutics, like the cognitive behavioral therapy. And so that onboard would be done by hopefully um, you know, certainly a prescriber, but then the actual onboarding is done usually by the company. So it's an easy uh, text message to the patient's phone once it's approved by insurance, and then it's adding it, and then someone can be on the phone to help them uh, help them uh, load it and kind of get started. And then um, I have, or the clinicians, so my therapists have it too, um, access to our dashboard, and so we see oh, the patient has been doing these modules or they didn't finish these modules or they, they skipped it all week and then we might wanna put a flag where we call them um, and reach out to them more frequently if they're not involved in the treatment that we suggest. So 
Um, and then the, that can be done on an outpatient or on an, I, an intensive outpatient level. So we have a lot of access um, for, from what we're seeing on the, um, on the clinician dashboard to see if we need to tighten up our teams um, at uh, bringing the patient in more frequently or bringing um, more tools to the patient. We, you know, we can see if they're having regular cravings, we can see when they're having regular cravings, if they're filling things out. So it's just, um, it's, it's a lot more than, than a therapist one-on-one -on -one, and then the therapist reporting to the doctor and the team. Great, Dr. Marco. So I consider digital therapeutics to be part of a bigger plan, a bigger care plan for our families. And so uh, kids that we see at Cortica range from, you know, just born to usually less than 21, although we still certainly have folks that are, um, that, that are older, they have all different kinds of labels. But when I'm thinking about a patient and their care plan, I don't think about those labels like autism or ADHD. Um, I, I find them to actually be uh, sort of back to um, Dr. Podesta's point about um, disruption to be somewhat archaic. And actually they don't help me think about what I need to do to help a child be able to do the things they need and wanna do. I look at what are the, th what are, what are the barriers? And so, for example, say that there is a 12 year old who is having difficulty with friendships and difficulty in school because they're having trouble just sort of staying on the, um, on the topic. Um, we would think about other things in the environment, home, school, community that we can do to help build their abilities to stay on topic, maybe um, smaller classrooms, um, practice with, um, you know, in a, in a, in a less um, environmentally rich um, uh, environment. And once we've sort of said that we've done all we can for the environment, or it's sometimes an iterative process, then the next would be thinking about brain training. And I would say that the digital therapeutics in general fall into that brain training. And when I think about brain training, there's sort of old school and new school. Old school are the things that we know work, things like occupational therapy, um, practice with, um, with physical therapy or music therapy or other ways that where you do things again and again to reframe the way that your brain is seeing something or reacting. And then there's the new school that are really much more pinpointed and in some ways really more personalized because one of the cool things about digital therapeutics is that there's an adaptive technology that's built in that's harder to do um, in the real world where you can say, I want this person to be able to succeed in this thing that we're gonna do 80% of the time so that they're not bored and they're not frustrated. And we know that that's the sweet spot. And once they're, they're able to do this sustained attention or they're able to switch tasks back and forth at this, at this designated sweet spot, then we're gonna make it get harder and we're gonna keep get building it and building it. And we're to, to Dr. Podesta's point, we're gonna be able to actually measure that in a way that we can't really do without sort of this level of technology. So that's a pretty cool aspect of the digital treatment space. I loved the point about being able to track compliance and being able also to predict, um, to be able to predict and also track ability across the lifetime of the, you know, of the training. And um, and then the third part of our care plan is thinking about um, other kinds of neurotherapeutics, but uh, you know, the chemical pieces, neurochemicals, dopamine, serotonin, and other aspects that may augment that training piece. And so. Um, in our, in our world, when we do a digital therapeutic, whether it's Endeavor for attention or um, the alpha stim device for parasympathetic tone, the, all these other take homes that we, that we like to use, different tools for different needs, we, um, we do it in a fairly prescribed way where we have a baseline, we have a two week follow up, we have a four week and we look at their abilities sort of pre and post so that we can see whether this is something that's helping and we want to continue, or maybe this is just not the right track for that patient. And so that's what it looks like within our practice. Dr. Banaka? 
Yeah, great, great comments. And I think um, in our practice, we're a little bit behind in terms of actually incorporating uh, digital therapeutics also because you know, data are emerging about their, their efficacy um, for cardiometabolic diseases. You know, our typical process is that we don't have a lot of time and patients have a lot of issues that they want to talk about. And, you know, again, it's not one system or one problem. These, these are, these are people, human beings, you know, and, and, and relatives and everything else. Right. So that, that, you know, we want to think about them as whole people. You have 15 minutes and there's their vascular comorbidities. There are their risk factors. Um, a lot of these things are interrelated, but, but require time to talk about them. And so in our typical clinics, we're very focused on, medical therapies and then risk factor modification. And we always recommend lifestyle. So you should stop smoking. You know, you, you need to improve your diet. You need to exercise more. Th those translate very poorly. I mean, the, people either do them or they don't. And just saying it in the clinic has impact, but, but it really doesn't move the needle for, for the majority of patients. Now we do have other ways of trying to address it. We have excellent nutritionists who, who are wonderful and, and that works for some patients. We have others that, that help support, but we have a big gap, which is that really addressing the drivers of these disease states. These are acquired problems. People aren't born with diabetes. They're not born with obesity. They're not born with vascular disease. They're acquired. And just educating someone that you know, these food groups aren't good for you when they already know that just doesn't work for a lot of patients. And I think cognitive behavioral therapy actually has very good data, but we've never been able to deliver it effectively in the cardiovascular clinic. We just don't have time. We don't have the resources. And as I mentioned, especially for rural patients and others, it's very difficult to do it. And so I think that's what's so exciting about digital therapeutics because it's not replacing something that we're doing, but it's really you know, meeting an unmet need here which is the ability to address the root causes of, of these drivers. And I, I believe that it will be a standard, you know, if we have good data to support these, it will be a standard part of the checklist of, you know, you need to help people stop smoking. You need to get them on a digital therapeutic to help them address the root causes. You know, as I mentioned earlier, drugs, the efficacy for drugs to lower A1C generally wane over time because people continue to progress. Th this has the potential for the opposite, right? If you can actually reverse the root causes, you could potentially have a growing impact over time and reverse the disease state itself. You can reverse type two diabetes, for example, if you can really empower someone to take control of all of those factors. So right now we're not doing a very good job of integrating into our clinics. I, I think that it will be a foundational therapy once we have the, the data and we can figure out how to integrate it. I've always, I've always said that if we had 12 step for diabetes or hypertension, it would be a whole different, uh, different area. And I think that this actually hits what I'm talking about, what I've been interested in, because it is a behavioral change that uh, each individual and our kind of culture can really uh, learn and use. Bola, you're muted. <laughs> I unmuted now. Can can everyone hear me, please? Yeah. Okay. So uh, last question, second to last question, is really um, the about the opportunities. So we're interested in uh, disease states that are addressable by digital therapeutics. We're interested in the typical patient as number two, um, and. I'm interested as well as uh, what what sort of emerging technologies could really accelerate uh, this field. So start with Dr. Banaka, uh, go to Dr. Marco, and then finish with Dr. Podesta. Well, I, I think there are tremendous opportunities here, in part because I think we have to rethink our approach to cardiometabolic diseases. It's not the band-aids for the risk factors. We're losing that fight, if you will. You know, the, the population is still growing, not, not in a good way. Um, and obesity is... And epidemics, those type two diabetes. So the opportunity here is really to, you know, apply a novel therapeutic intervention to try to address root cause. You know, just as as was discussed, I think there are specific areas where this probably will have the greatest impact. Uh, type two diabetes um, is associated with tremendous morbidity and cost, and it, it is a behavioral disease in many ways, as was said. And I think that's a huge opportunity. 
I think that um, you know medication adherence, smoking cessation, which is a huge driver of cardiovascular risk, and even areas like supervised exercise, which for vascular disease is a class one recommendation for the guidelines, but it's very difficult for patients to access, to go into a center and have the coaching done, all those sort of things. Th th those are huge opportunities that have the, the ability, potential ability to, to improve outcomes. We also know that you know, sodium restriction and uh, lowering blood pressure, which is clearly, you know, but all of the, the data and the American Heart Association and others show that you can lower your blood pressure through moderating sodium, increasing potassium, healthy diet. You know, we know blood pressure is exquisitely linked to stroke risk and we can potentially reduce really horrible outcomes like stroke and then even lipid management, things like triglycerides are, is another opportunity. I think one of the one of the challenges and opportunities is to integrate these type of digital therapeutics with collecting data in, in ways and wearables and other things that make it very easy for the patient to integrate these experiences. So whether it's the scale in their bathroom that's communicating, their glucometer, their heart rate, their blood pressure, the more we can in, integrate those metrics into these therapeutics, I think the, the more powerful they'll be. Got it. And a reminder, uh, it's disease states, the, the patient archetype, and um, maybe emerging technology. So next panelist, please. Oh, wait, give me those again so I can make sure I hit them. Oh, um, where you feel that these technologies can best be applied going forward. So investors need to forecast uh, revenues and everything else. So what's the right disease state um, is from your perspective? What's the uh, uh, ideal patient? And then what emerging technologies could advance the field if, if you have any? Yeah, ideas. got it. So I would say, um, again, if I were gonna be disruptive rather than the classic disease states, ADHD, autism, um, developmental coordination disorder, I would think domain specific. So sustained attention, cognitive flexibility, social reciprocity and go for the actual thing that you're trying to improve because then you're working memory, processing speed, those specific functions. Um, that being said, I, I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but I, I throw that out there just so that we can all be disruptive together. If I were thinking about the typical patients in sort of my world, these are kids um, who are often um, elementary and um, junior high and high school because they're the ones who are often able to engage best. So we're talking about sort of six to 16. Um, certainly there's a huge, um, a, a huge market uh, in, the, in the adults. We've got a 13 to 17 trial going on right now. But, um, but I always think that the earlier you start, the better your outcomes are gonna be. And, um, and I would certainly sleep. I know Dr. Podesta talked about that. That's gonna be, I think, a huge um, place where we can uh, really dig deep and get benefit from digital take-home devices. I think the social reciprocity is something that digital devices have been trying to get us um, some inroads in, and I think we'll be getting there in the next couple of years. Um, exercise, I think, is something that we're really thinking about and pairing cognitive training with physical training so that both of those um, practices are targeted to the same goal is going to get us to the next step. We've been a little bit stymied because sometimes um, people are doing like Sudoku at the same time they're riding an exercise bicycle and that just doesn't actually work. I think um, the other one that I think is going to be really interesting, important to look at is autonomic regulation. So sympathetic and parasympathetic training and using digital devices. And as Dr. Panaka was saying, some feedback mechanisms in order to be able to get us to where we want to go. The other places that I think I'd be watching is pairing these digital devices with specific genetics. So exercise training with BDNF would be a pairing that I think is worth watching. Um, and then in terms of emerging technologies, I agree. I think a lot of this is getting from the, um, the iPad or the iPhone to more of a wearable with more of the sort of um, constant feedback loop. And so I think that's the, um, that's the emerging. Great, Dr. Podesta. I love all of this. And I love that um, everyone on this group is also uh, really thinking about domain space versus diagnosis because we need to get away from, you know, from name it, and blame it 
and then use a medication or a Band-Aid, like Dr. Banaka says, to tame it. But so all of the things we're doing are um, really getting into behavioral change and cognitive behavioral therapy te te teaches a behavioral transformation that makes it into a more health forward lifestyle. So, you know, the five fundamentals for just general health other than genetics, which of course are, you know, not necessarily a predestiny, um, but are your sleep. And so anything having to do with sleep and many, many disease states are, um, are responsive to sleep improvement. Your nutrition, many disease states are responsible for nutrition improvements from all of the metabolics, you know, cardiac, even Alzheimer's, stress regulation, um, so coping, all of these can be um, addressed with a cognitive behavioral therapy or a digital therapeutic. Um, exercise, you know, there's loads of um, non prescription digital therapeutics that are related to exercise and then trackability and adherence, we could migrate that into a digital. And then another thing that affects metabolic is just your breath work, breathing, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of room to adapt things medically like that too. So that being said, anything that is an outcome of any of those five things, any disease state that's an outcome of any of those being disrupted or be, being uh, non unhealthy or, or less than optimal can be improved with uh, digital therapeutics. One thing that we haven't talked about is uh, we, you talked a little bit, Mark, Dr. Marco, about some cognitive performance um, executive functioning, but what about Alzheimer's prevention? That is such a heavy, heavy uh, burden financially on our system. And if we can make some headway in some uh, in early prevention and early treatment, then with just something as simple as a therapeutic, because our medications, as we know, kind of halt, slightly halt the progress of the disease, but don't reverse the disease. So if we can start with prevention and then early treatment um, uh, using yeah. these can be great. So for our final question, I usually like to close um, by asking each panelist to ask one question to one other panelist. Uh, it's in the spirit of me not knowing what I don't know, and that's why we rely on experts. So Dr. Podesta, one, one question to someone else, and please answer in one minute or less, just given our time. Okay, um, Dr. Marco, to the point that we've all been talking about that it's more domain than disease, you've been using Endeavor for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. What other positives in kids' behaviors or in patients' behaviors and lifestyles other than just improved attention are outcomes. Yeah, I mean, the one that's the most concrete is um, the parents often will report that just getting up and dressed in the morning. And so it's, it's all downstream of being able to kind of stay on target, stay on task. But, um, but I love that because as a parent, um, you know, it's Monday morning, having um, your kid be able to actually get up and get dressed um, and out the door is huge lifestyle for everybody. So that's my one minute. All right, Dr. Marco, you are, please ask someone else uh, a question. So Dr. Banaka, one of the trends that I'm seeing, not necessarily among my kids, but among the community and colleagues are wearable glucose mon monitors for folks who don't have diabetes yet. And I'm wondering if you have a thought or comment about um, the constant monitoring and whether you see that having a benefit um, for preventative, um, preventative health care for adults. Yeah, great question. I, I think continuous glucose monitoring is really exciting. We're still learning about it, but it is probably the most immediate feedback loop, right? To say what I ate just now and had this effect on my glucose. And I think it would pair really well with a digital therapeutic and cognitive behavioral therapy around sort of understanding then what, why did you do that or, or how can you address and improve the behavior? So I, I think it's a really exciting immediate feedback loop. We have heart rate, um, we, you know, people can measure blood pressure at home, but glucose is important. It's a great question. And Dr. Banaka, please close it out. Well, I was gonna ask Dr. Podesta and build on, on the question um, uh, from Dr. Marco, you know, we're talking at least in the cardiometabolic space about treating disease, people who have diabetes, have vascular disease. Could we move backwards? You talked about sleep disorders, other, other markers. Could we get back to primary prevention or even primordial prevention where we take healthy individuals, detect early the signals, you know, sleep dysfunction, whatever that could lead down the road to developing disease and intervene at that time to actually prevent the onset of these conditions? 
Um, I think that's a great tool. And I know that there are certain very specialized uh, preventive clinics that are doing things like that, uh, maybe looking at biomarkers as well as genetics. Um, and I love Dr. Marco's suggestion of pairing some of this with um, biomarkers and genetic uh, predilection. Of course, genetics are not your fate, but they are certainly contributory to certain disease states. Um, and then adding uh, some of the best tools that we have, such as these um, retraining or you know, education and modules to really change behavior to uh, affect that. And then it could be um, done from a primary care, you know, regular uh, yearly annual visit, as opposed to from a, uh, when you're seeing someone for a disease. Great, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists for this, the fantastic insight. So thank you to Dr. Bunaka, thank you to Dr. Podesta, and thank you to Dr. Marco.